Walken's Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. Geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And if you are new to the show, there are lots of ways to uh, listen. You can, of course, follow through the RSS feed. You can download directly at my site and on American Freedom Radio. I'm also on iTunes. <clears throat> Excuse me, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, uh, Google Play, and of course on Friday nights from 10 to midnight, you can hear me rebroadcast on a host of other networks, including uh, People's Internet Radio, uh, Awake Radio.us, uh, PSN, and Ed Opperman's Spreaker channel. Uh, well, um, uh, <laughs> as you can already tell, I'm a, a little uh, under the weather today. I have. Um, uh, what uh, Bob Newhart uh, used to refer to as a weekend cold. I have a little bit of a hangover, so we'll, so uh, you know, bear with me if uh, the the first hour is a little uh, rough. But uh, it was a I had uh, not really a rough night last night, but certainly a rough morning. Lots of uh, things I had to juggle and uh, figure out uh, relating to uh, work and other stuff. So I'm a uh, you know, a little stressed out, but uh, I I always uh, like the show as a as a way to kind of unwind and to uh, forget about uh, all of the other worries in my life and just focus on uh, talking to you, the listener. And um, this first hour, I am going to be going solo. Uh, and in the second hour, uh, we've got a good friend of the show, Kevin Gastola from Shadowproof.com, and we're going to be talking about uh, James Wolf, who is a Excuse me. He was a, uh, a Senate uh, staffer, uh, worked uh, as head of security for the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, and he's recently uh, been charged with lying to the FBI uh, relating to leaks, possibly. And it's a case that we we briefly uh, touched on the last time Kevin was on the show. And there's a, a whole other level to this case involving. Uh, journalist uh, Ali Watkins, who is having uh, a three-year relationship with uh, James Wolfe, and she is a national security intelligence uh, reporter who's worked for a, a ton of news outlets. So I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but that's what we're going to be talking about in the second hour uh, with Kevin. Oh, very and uh, very briefly, I just wanted to plug um, the uh, uh, bonus podcast on Patreon for Por Porkins Policy Radio is out and available. It is quite a long episode. I think you'll you'll really get your money's worth this month. It's a two-hour uh, show I did with our good friend Chuck Ocelli talking about one of our favorite TV shows, Counterpart, which is on Stars, it, it um, the network, uh, and it uh, the cast is amazing. It's got uh, J.K. Simmons, uh, uh, Nazni Boniadi, Olivia Williams, Harry Lloyd, uh, Stephen Ray. Uh, great, great actors um, all around. Uh, it's an amazing show, so I, I definitely encourage people to check out uh, Counterpart, and definitely I, I would check it out before our uh, listening to our episode because it's it's very long, it's very detailed, um, and uh, we we do spoil some massive uh, parts of the show. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, out on if you go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redman, you can uh, stream the episode right there or you can download it as well. And if you want to support my work, you can of course uh, sign up for as little as a dollar a month on my Patreon. Also, uh, the uh, Porkins a Great Game, the episode is basically, um, you know, it's, it's in the can, so to speak. I've just got to do a little bit of editing on it, but I am hoping to post that either tonight um, or uh, sometime uh, tomorrow. Um, you know, worst case, it'll be out uh, very early uh, in August. Um, but I do want to try to get it out as soon as possible because there's some some sort of time-sensitive uh, reporting that Christoph and I 
uh, did on that episode. Great episode, too. I think people will be really uh, pleased. We, we get into a lot of interesting topics. We talk about this uh, bizarre bomb plot uh, that uh, the MEK is alleging um, by the Iranian regime. We talk about the Turkish elections, uh, the NATO summit, uh, how it's affecting Germany. Um, we uh, talk a little bit about our, our good friend uh, Abdul Rashid Dastum, the vice president or warlord turned vice president of Afghanistan. Uh, really good episode, so uh, look for that. That should be out soon. But anyway... I'll stop uh, trying to, f- to fill some time right now and, and get into... I do have a, a show here for the first hour. And um, I was originally, I was going to cover a couple of stories um, that uh, I thought were a little maybe underreported or overlooked and stuff. And then I sort of ended up uh, basically just uh, doing an entire, you know, writing up the notes for an entire uh, show just devoted to the recent elections in Pakistan. Uh, and I and I I think this is a it's a fun topic. It's something that I have discussed in the past. Uh, faithful listeners will know um, that uh, you know when I uh, I was a political science major in college, and my focus was uh, mainly in South Asia, so Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, uh, th- those were the two countries that I, I focused most on. So Pakistan has always sort of uh, held a special place in my heart, and it's a it's always a fascinating country to uh, discuss and in a lot of ways it, it's also fascinating the way the media portrays Pakistan uh, particularly in the West so I thought we could kind of uh, get into that today if we, if we, you know, if I don't uh, if I get everything out of the way there's a couple other stories that we can touch on but I, I think there's a lot here uh, with uh, what's going on in Pakistan so I guess we'll just sort of start with uh, last week on July 25th General elections were held in Pakistan, and the uh, former international cricket star and uh, jet-setting playboy Imran Khan and his uh, party, the Pakistan Tariq e Insaf party, won uh, the election. Now uh, they uh, there are about I think it's 270 uh, seats within parliament. And the PIT, this is Imran Khan's party, they won 116 seats. And then we had 64 seats going to the uh, Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, which was is the the party uh, f- uh, founded by Nawaz Sharif, who we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. He was the uh, recently he was the uh, the the prime minister of Pakistan, but he was uh, ousted. Uh, because of the Panama Papers, and uh, I actually talked about that in some detail uh, back on episode 102, so I'll refer listeners uh, to that episode. But uh, the Pakistan Muslim League, the PMLN, got 64 seats. The Pakistan People's Party, the PPP, which is uh, the other major party along with the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, uh, they garnered uh, 43 seats, and then we have 47 seats going to a whole uh, slew of other parties. Um, you know, and, and uh, again, uh, in, in spite of the sort of spin that we get uh, from much of the media, there is a a very you know uh, diverse set of political parties in Pakistan. Uh, they you know there are more than just two parties, which are basically one party that you can vote for in Pakistan. Uh, they do have a, you know, a vibrant political system. Uh, so there are a lot of other parties that gained, uh, you know, small, small amounts of seats. And, um, I'll, I'll throw up, uh, there's a, you know, pretty good, a uh, couple articles that we can, uh, point to in the show notes that will have a breakdown uh, if you're interested in, in all of the, the smaller parties that uh, did well in the, in the elections. But anyway, the, uh, PIT, uh, or the PTI, excuse me, um, uh, did win. Uh, they, you know, they, they uh, uh, essentially um, they were just short of a majority. So they will have to form uh, a coalition with some of the smaller parties. And it's being reported that Imran Khan is already reaching out to several of them. Uh, there's a, you know, there, there's a report I just saw a few hours ago that, um, you know, he, he's maybe trying to uh, gain uh, support from. I think it was the uh, MQMP party, um, which is a uh, you know it, it's a it's a the uh, it's, I think it's actually a former rival of uh, of uh, Khan, um, but uh, you know he has to he has to uh, figure out some sort of a coalition government. 
And Khan is expected to take oath as prime minister around uh, August 11th. Uh, and um, we're already seeing a huge uh, pushback from the PPP and the PMLN. They have agreed to, uh, you know, and these are these are basically rivals of each other. Uh, but they have agreed on a quote coordinated joint strategy to um, basically block and, uh, you know, make sure that Khan, uh, you know, has trouble forming a government. And a lot of this is due to the widespread uh, reports of uh, fraud in the election, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. But as I said, Khan will be uh, taking his oath of office as Prime Minister of Pakistan on August 11th. He's going to be taking over from uh, Nasrul Mulk, who has uh, been acting as the caretaker Prime Minister since June 1st. And he took over from Shahid uh, Khan, who, of, uh, um, I'm sorry, Shahid Khan uh, Abbasi, who, of course, took over after Nawaz Sharif who was ousted because of the Panama Papers. And and in a nutshell, and again, I encourage people to go check out episode 102 uh, for, for more detail on that. But basically, uh, it was, uh, you know, one of the, the uh, major stories to come out of the Panama Papers were these reports that Nawaz Sharif and his daughter uh, and his whole family, essentially, but really his daughter and him, uh, you know, they had all of these expensive properties. I think some of them were in London. There were others uh, spread around Pakistan and other places. I think, um, if I remember correctly, I think Dubai might have even been mentioned as one of them. And, you know, the, the sort of average corruption that is uh, fairly normal in, uh, in Pakistan, and certainly in all governments. I mean, there's nothing surprising about this. And indeed, there was nothing surprising about uh, the the idea that Sharif had you know was funneling money uh, and you know doing some shady stuff because everybody um, you know as many people in Pakistan pointed out everyone is doing this if you're in government um, this is nothing new again it's nothing new in, in our government either uh, but the you know they did go very hard on Nawaz Sharif and uh, uh, the, the military which we'll talk about um, in just a moment. Uh, which uh, has never been super big on Nawaz Sharif, and of course the military in Pakistan is the real power uh, that you know rules the country. Uh, they certainly backed uh, you know the the investigations looking into him. Anyway, Nawaz Sharif was ousted, um, and uh, he's now in hospital under lock and key after leaving prison due to heart problems. So he was in prison, and then. Uh, and Nawaz Sharif has, has long suffered, um, you know, heart problems. I think he had a, a bypass surgery uh, several years ago, uh, and he he had to be moved to a hospital to monitor uh, him and whatnot. Uh, and it, it's basically, you know, it, it's in the Pakistani press. It's you know, it's being described as, uh, you know, he just moved his prison cell uh, to. Um, I think it's a. a PIM is the is the name of the, the this large uh, medical facility, um, but you know that, that's basically how they're uh, phrasing it. Now, the election, as I said, has been plagued by these rumors of fraud and rigging, and uh, you know the PPP and the Pakistan Muslim League, uh, and along with most of the other fairly well established parties, concur with this this idea, and. As I said, it, it's they're alleging that this has been orchestrated by the military to elect Khan, and there is a, a, a pretty widespread uh, coalition, as I said, uh, of political parties and former uh, uh, major political figures that have joined together uh, and are, are speaking out about what they see as being uh, some sort of a, a rigged election. Uh, this includes even uh, Prime Minister uh, Gailani, um, who uh, uh, was, you know, people might remember him. Um, he was <laughs> he was during this period just after 9/11, I believe, um, where there were like four or five different uh, prime ministers. Uh, you know, they kept kind of coming and going. But it's you know, a lot of people are, are kind of behind this. And you know, to be fair. It probably is true. As I said, the military has always been the main sort of, you know, the true source of power within Pakistan. 
And the and as I said, the military definitely didn't, you know, like Sharif. They never hid their dislike of of Sharif. And uh, you know, they they very well might have, uh, you know, uh, rigged certain. You know, some of some of the allegations are, um, you know, that. Uh, polling places had data altered that um opposition party uh officials you know who were who were tasked with overseeing uh certain election districts you know they weren't allowed in all that kind of stuff and again i wouldn't really put it past the, the military to do something like this um and as i said they they've always kind of hated sharif and this this election well, obviously, the Pakistan Muslim League is the biggest loser in the election, even though it did gar- you know, gain more seats than the uh, PPP. But uh, certainly, I think the military wanted to send a message, and they wanted to make sure that the, you know the, the, this chapter um, with Sharif and and his uh, family and corruption was sort of over. And you can go back to 1999. There was a military coup um, when uh, Sharif was, was prime minister back in, in 1999. There was a military coup that overthrew him then as well. So clearly there, you know, there, there is a trend here. Um, now, here's the interesting thing. I mean, if, if people don't know who Imran Khan is, I, you know, you, I, I don't know where you've been because he, uh, <laughs> he is a, this very charismatic figure and he has, um, uh, you know, made a splash for a number of years now. Um, and he's a really fascinating person. Look up, you know, look up a picture of him. He is this, you know, very kind of debonair, uh, very dashing man, you know, very handsome. Uh, he has this playboy lifestyle, you know, when he was, uh, an international cricketer. Um, you know, he was, a uh, lived in these extravagant mansions and you know he he was uh, very into the nightlife in London um you know then he became uh a quote you know philanthropist there's uh you know lots of famous pictures of him and princess diana um you know shaking hands with children in hospitals and things like that uh and then he kind of reinvented himself yet again as a politician and as this sort of opposition figure within uh, Pakistan. And he has kind of bumped around for many, many years in Pakistan with his uh, party, uh, with the, the PIT. And, you know, it, it's it's very interesting the way that this whole election is being uh uh, you know, uh, described, I guess, uh, the way it's being framed um, by a lot of people in the West is that this, you know, Imran Khan is Pakistan's Donald Trump. And this is, you know, I mean, there, there's, uh, well, I'll link up to it in the show notes. I mean, there's a couple articles that just, I think there's a, uh, one, uh, one that I read that was in, you know, this Time Magazine article that basically says, you know, is Donald Trump, is uh, Imran Khan Pakistan's Donald Trump? And according to the Western press, he absolutely is. Uh, and to a degree, there there is something uh, to that description. He is a celebrity, as I said. I mean, he's huge, um, both in 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 South Asia and also in you know Europe and uh, in any any country that plays cricket. He's a huge star. Um, but you know, certainly like in India, he you know even though he's Pakistani and you know that they're supposed to hate each other, he's a huge deal in India. He's like a sex symbol amongst the the Indian population, or has been for many many years. Um, you know the, the same in England. He uh, was married to uh, God. What's her? What's her? Uh, Jemima Goldsmith, uh, who um, runs the New Statesman, uh, and she, you know she comes from a very wealthy uh, family in England. You know he was married to her for for many years. Um, you know so he, he is a, he is a celebrity. He is a playboy. Uh, he is definitely known for extreme extravagance. Just like Donald Trump, uh, he is scandal-ridden, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and like Donald Trump, he has almost no political experience. Now, while he has been this opposition political figure, or you know, in, and you know, as the president of his political party, he really hasn't done much of anything. Um, you know, he's never had to, uh, you know, ad- ad- administer a province in Pakistan. You know, he wasn't the mayor of a of a large city. He's never worked in uh, another uh, administration. So he really has like zero political experience, uh, and he is also prone to making ex- extremely outrageous comments, uh, just like Donald Trump. 
And um, while and very similar to Donald Trump, while he lives in the lap of luxury, Imran Khan, uh, he is always claiming to understand the real Pakistan, you know, and and he knows what the you know the the average uh, poor working class Pakistani wants, you know, uh, and he has run on this very populist uh, platform. So in in some ways, um, you know, Imran Khan was trying to uh, you know uh, make Pakistan great again. Um, so there is something to that, and even more so. He uh, ran against the dynastic establishment, uh, just like Donald Trump did. So, you know, Donald Trump ran against Hillary Clinton, um, who's, you know, certainly uh, of the, the sort of dynastic, uh, you know, political families here in America. And the same is true of Imran Khan. So, um, you know, his, his two uh, major uh, opponents and, and rivals... Uh, for the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, we have Shabazz Sharif, who is Nawaz's brother. Um, and then in the PPP, the Pakistan People's Party, uh, he was running against uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto's son. He was running against, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Bilarar Bhutto Zardari, who's the son of Asif Ali Zardari, who was president of Pakistan for a little while, and Benazir Bhutto, who of course is a very famous prime minister who was assassinated in Pakistan. Um, so let's not, you know, so that is absolutely true. Um, you know, and, and again, both uh, Bhutto Zardari and Shabazz Sharif, uh, you know, they, they, it's sort of like they're expected to become, uh, I mean, the, Bhutto Zardari is even where, I mean, this kid is. I don't know what he's, you know, he just, again, he expects that he should be uh, prime minister because his mother was and because his father was the president. But let's not kid ourselves. Imran Khan is the establishment, exactly like Donald Trump. Um, you know, Imran Khan is absolutely part of the establishment. Um, you know, he is a fabulously wealthy. Um, you know, he uh, operates in those lofty circles within Pakistan. And, you know, like Donald Trump, he pretends to, you know, he uh, uses this facade of being, uh, I don't know, working class or something like that. Again, while, you know, Imran Khan lives in these massive mansions, he's got, you know, houses all over the place, impeccably dressed. Uh, you know, the, the man is rich. The man knows how to live. Uh, so, you know, it, there is something interesting here. There is this sort of, um, uh, you know, connection here. We can make connections between Imran Khan and Donald Trump's, uh, you know, rise to power. So, very interesting. I do think it's a little bit overblown, some of the, uh, you know, assertions that the, the that that Imran Khan is, is you know, the Pakistan's Donald Trump. I think that uh, a lot of time it's a great way to sell newspapers and or, you know, articles online, I guess. Uh, it, 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 it's also a wonderful way to explain a very uh, complex political system and a very complex person like Imran Khan to a Western public that knows absolutely nothing about Pakistani politics. So it's very easy to say, oh, well, he's just the, he's their uh, country's Trump. You know, sort of in, the, in a similar way that, like, um, uh, Duterte in the Philippines uh, has been, you know, described as the, the Filipino Trump. Now, yeah, I mean, there's, like, some truth to that, I guess. And certainly, I, you know, as far as I know, the, the two of them, uh, I think, like each other, or, or, or Trump has spoken positively of uh, Duterte in the past. But there's so much more to what's going on in the Philippines right now and the 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 type of person that uh, Duterte is uh than just saying he's Donald Trump but it is a, it is an interesting analogy and i think it you know it hits on so many um similarities that you know we can make that for Pakistan but keep that in mind you know because we're also going to see um a lot of people and and let me i'll, I'll throw it out there i um have always been fascinated with Imran Khan i think he's this you know amazing uh, figure to uh, to observe and to study. You know, I personally I don't like him. Um, you know, I I think that he's kind of um, much like Donald Trump. I I think he's he's sort of playing at uh, politics in, in for some other reason. Um, I don't know if it's really to enrich himself in the same way that Donald Trump is. But you know, it seems like Imran Khan is just sort of um, 
he's like doing it almost like for fun you know like this is what I'm you know now you know I was an international cricket star then I was an international playboy then I was an international uh, philanthropist now I'm going to be an international you know political figure uh, and I, I think it, you know it's, it's sort of like like a notch in his belt um, I don't really believe that he actually uh, gives a shit about um, you know the average Pakistani I don't think he really under and, and you know, very much like Donald Trump, I don't think he really understands the complexities of uh, what it means to be the prime minister of Pakistan and how that's going to fit in with um, regionally and internationally as well. Um, you know, so I, I don't have a lot of faith in Imran Khan. Um, you know, but again, all the same, I, I, it is it is interesting looking at these parallels between the two. Um, but let's let's break it down a little bit because, as I said, the media here in the U.S. and and in Europe as well, it just in the West in general, uh, loves to uh, simplify all of this stuff. Um, and like I said, while I don't like Imran Khan, I don't think it's entirely fair to say he's Donald Trump because there are some there are some interesting possibilities that might actually unfold because Imran Khan is prime minister and that will be very interesting uh, to see if, if that really kind of takes hold so let's break down a little bit uh, Imran Khan the his political party his political agenda and what might happen in the near future uh, with that so um, you know I think first and foremost we, we should address a little bit uh, a little bit more in, in some more detail the um, the situation like with the military and um, and Imran Khan because I think this is you know first and foremost my major takeaway from this whole election is that the you know the military uh, is is firmly in control of the situation now generally speaking uh, you know I think they're always uh, in control um, and and this is something that you know I will say uh, that I, I can't stand people will say that oh, Pakistan is like a failed state. Or, or the a rogue state, you know, like that. That's the the new kind of uh, term that they like to use, and the, and they always talk about, you know, oh, it's at, it's at the brink of of collapse and stuff like that. And again, and I've said this before, um, you know, uh, and there is a, a pretty good book by a mainstream writer, Anatole Levin. Um, but I, I've referenced the book before, and it, it's a it's a nice overview. If you don't know much about Pakistan, it, it's worth getting. It's a nice big thick book, um, and uh, and Anatole Levin is absolutely an establishment you know kind of think tank uh, writer but it's a it's a good book it's a good overview and then the the book the name of the book is called Pakistan a hard country and that is sort of like a a phrase that is used to describe Pakistan by Pakistanis um you know that it's a hard country and that is absolutely true in spite of all this craziness you know oh it's a rogue state or they're funding terrorism and and they're gonna, they're on the brink of collapse Pakistan as a modern nation state has never collapsed. It still exists. It is still, um, you know, obviously they, they don't they don't control, um, you know, Bangladesh anymore. Bangladesh is a, is a separate country. Um, but aside from that, I, I mean, you know, the, Pakistan has maintained Pakistan. They have not fallen. Um, you know, uh, they they haven't fallen apart because of terrorism. Uh, they haven't, um, you know, uh, turned into um, Somalia. Uh, you know, which is is, is a, another one of these countries, the, the lump uh, those those two countries together. It is not North Korea either. Okay, um, you know, it, there is it is a vibrant society within Pakistan. Now it may now I'm not saying that like it's great um, when the military overthrows uh, the, the government, which they have you know routinely. You will see a lot of these Western articles too uh, talking about that. You know, this will be. Um, you know, only the second uh, peaceful trans or democratic transition of power in, excuse me, in Pakistan. Um, meaning that you know there was the military hasn't stepped in. Again, that's kind of debatable. Um, it, you know, if the military was rigging uh, provinces, uh, you know, to vote a certain way, I don't know if we really call that the, you know, uh, regular de democratic handover of government. Um, and also the fact that uh, obviously the uh, military, you know, put their faith in the Panama Papers, which is some kind of intelligence operation, probably by the CIA, um, to oust 
Sharif. You know, I don't know if we can really call any of this very different, but all the same, um, you know, Pakistan has maintained its own integrity as a nation state. So I think we need to kind of keep that in mind um, when we discuss Pakistan. Again, it's not, it's by no means perfect, but it is not a failed state. It is not, um, you know, uh, you know, it gets everything. It's a terrorist state. It's a narco state. It, it's not really any of those things. It is a very unique country. Um, and, uh, and overall, you know, it, it has maintained that. So, you know, but like I said, the, the, the military, I think, is firmly in control of the situation. And there are times where the military has certainly, um, I guess we can say allowed for certain political figures to rise and, and maybe gain power. Um, and I think that is just, you know, a matter of, uh, that you, you have to allow opposition figures to come to power every once in a while. Uh, and I, and I say opposition figure, you know, in, in air quotes. Um, the military has never been super cool with Nawaz Sharif, yet Nawaz Sharif has been prime minister multiple times, okay? Uh, and, I mean, spanned, you know, pre-9-11, post-9-11, uh, you know, it, it, you know, and I say that because it, after 9-11, I mean, there's certainly uh, a, 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 you know, distinctive change in Pakistan in terms of, uh, you know, the intelligence apparatus and what was going on there, you know, so... The military has not been uh, keen necessarily on Sharif, but he's still been prime minister. Um, you know, they didn't like Benazir Bhutto, um, and obviously she met with a, a pretty terrible end. Uh, that might, you know, most likely was some kind of a joint operation involving um, aspects of the military, the ISI, and, uh, you know, various uh, radical terrorist groups. Uh, but still, she was still elected prime minister. Um, and again, you know, <laughs> Pakistan has elected more women to higher office than we have. Uh, so, you know, when we uh, want to point our, our finger at, at those, you know, backwards Pakistanis, let's keep that in mind. Um, you know, so the, the safety valve has to be released every once in a while. But I think that the situation with uh, Sharif became more and more untenable. And, you know, th I think the military one wants to move on somewhat. And what better figure than Imran Khan? He's handsome. He's, uh, you know, very popular. He, uh, while he is absolutely an establishment figure, he uh, appeals to the populist mentality within the country. So I think all of that works uh, in the military's favor. And, of course, fresh face. You know, it's not uh, one of Sharif's uh, brothers or uh, family members. It is not a, uh, you know, a relic from, from uh, you know, the Pakistan People's Party. You know, it's not, uh, you know, uh, Zardari and Bhutto's son. It's a whole different guy. I think that is is wonderful. B you know, and again, while the Western media is constantly, and this is also in, in South Asian media, Pakistani, India, um, Afghanistan as well, uh, Iran to a lesser extent, um, you know, they're also phrasing this as, you know, this is brand new opportunity. I think Erdogan called Imran Khan to, to congratulate him. Uh, maybe it was either today or yesterday. And, you know, he said, oh, this is a, a new step in Pakistan's political system, you know, and that this is a great opportunity for you. So this is all wonderful. You know, we can, again, the, the real power source, the military, the intelligence, you know, the, the Pakistani deep state, um, for lack of a better word, this, I think, plays totally in their favor because they've got this wonderful new guy that they can kind of trot out um, and, uh, and and use and, and say, you know, we've moved on. It's it's no longer this, you know, this, there's a new dynasty in town, um, you know, and he's just kind of getting started. The other thing is uh, I think they also like Khan because he's so pliable. Um, this is a man that, again... Um, you know, I think is easily manipulated. Um, that's my impression of him. And if if several 
of these stories are true about his cocaine use, he is absolutely pliable. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there have been rumors circulating for several years that Imran Khan is a pretty heavy cocaine user. Um, this has even been, you know, this is like on mainstream television in Pakistan, like GOTV and, and stuff like that, openly speak about Imran Khan's cocaine use. Uh, various other political parties have brought this up within, in, in parliament. Uh, and one of Imran Khan's, I think it was his second or th- maybe his third, no, this is his second wife. Um, you know, they're, they're now since divorced. They were married for a very brief period of time. She wrote a pretty scandalous tell-all book, um, where she didn't even, she, I mean, she called out everybody. You know, lots of people in Imran Khan's, uh, party, people in other political parties, but I'll link up to it because it's just such an amazing story, if it's true, um, about his, like, rampant cocaine use. And also, you know, that he would, um, that, uh, he occasionally smoked, uh, heroin to, to unwind. Now, again, I don't really know, um, how true any of these stories are. It is certainly widely accepted in, um, Pakistani society that this is true and uh, to be honest I mean I I don't know if he's like actively using cocaine the way he is although you know there was a funny thing um, this is sort of like tangent well it's just sort of a it's it's some inside baseball Pakistani politics there was uh, some sort of a summit or meeting um, that was uh, um, going on or it might have even been this this crazy protest um, the sit-in that Imran Khan and the um, the PIT a uh, PTI um, held, but there was this whole question. Uh, this is thing about like getting food to them, um, and uh, you know, and, and Imran Khan was saying that uh, the government wasn't allowing food to come in for this meeting or something like that. And um, <laughs> I think it was someone within the um, Pakistan Muslim League uh, basically said something to the effect of. You know, nobody is, everyone is allowing food to come in. The only thing that they may not be allowing in is cocaine. Um, <laughs> now, again, I don't know, um, how true this is, but I wouldn't, I- I'm sure he's got skeletons in his closet. You know, this is a, a man like Donald Trump is, uh, you know, complete with scandals. Um, he's all, you know, he was known as having a very, uh, you know, healthy sexual appetite. Uh, you know, again, rumors of, you know, that he, he had only had threesomes, uh, you know, for, for many years. That was his thing. Um, so I'm sure that they've got dirt on him. And again, I think that's why he's a perfect candidate. He is so pliable. He will bend to whatever the military says. And, and, you know, and, and, uh, so, uh, I think in that sense, they love him too. Cause they, they've got him over a barrel. Much in the same way, I think, um, you know, certain, uh, groups and stuff have Trump over a barrel. And again, that's, that's all presidents, you know? Nobody gets to become president in the United States or in Pakistan without there being some kind of dirt. You know, you need to have something on somebody, um, if you're gonna be able to control them and manipulate them. And I think in Khan, they've got a huge, they've got an ample, uh, amount of stuff that they can point to. And like I said, though, after Sharif's ousting, they need some form of stability. And maybe they, they, I think they see that more so with Khan, even though there's already, you know, this huge opposition to him and a lot of people are uniting and whatnot. Um, but at the same time, you know, for uh, if you're a small political party or a smaller political party in Pakistan, Khan needs to form a coalition. You could get a tremendous amount of power. So it is also advantageous for some of these smaller parties to join up with him. Now, um, so those are my takeaways in terms of uh, the, the major ones, how the military kind of views this. But here's another interesting aspect to Imran Khan's uh, ascendancy to uh, Prime Minister. Uh, one of his nicknames um, is Taliban Khan, okay? And uh, and again, it's like openly used in in uh, you know the press and, and all the you know politicians and uh, you know people in Pakistan they, they they call him Taliban Khan. And this is because um, 
you know, he has made some very provocative statements about the Taliban. Um, he is viewed as a, not not in favor of them, but he has got one of the more uh, I, I think actually reasonable viewpoints with the Taliban. Uh, you know, Khan believes that. Um, you know, fighting them is not going to work. That there has to be some kind of a political solution, um, both with the, the, the Taliban in Afghanistan, but also the Pakistani Taliban. And he's even gone so far as to say that the Pakistani Taliban should be able to run, um, you know, for political office, that they should have a, you know, that they should have a legitimate, um, political party within Pakistan. And, uh, you know, he's also been, um, you know, more uh, in in favor of you know peace talks in Afghanistan. He basically d- doesn't believe that attacking them is really going to do any good. And you know, if we're be- you know, it- it's funny too uh, that they call him the Taliban Khan. Excuse me. Uh, even though uh, I mean, clearly the ISI and the military in Pakistan and and many prime ministers and. Uh, presidents and stuff, are, you know, actually are working with the Taliban, you know, uh, fairly openly. Um, you know, there's no secret that the military and the ISI have been funding and, you know, um, helping the Taliban for decades, I mean, since their inception. So it's funny that, you know, but, but Imran Khan, because he, he, he makes a statement, uh, he gets labeled Taliban Khan. For a little bit more context to that also, I mean, he when um, people will remember uh, Malala, this young girl who gets shot on a bus by members of the Pakistani Taliban. Uh, I believe it was Pakistani Taliban. Uh, and then somehow she lived and she went to London and, you know, had surgeries and stuff uh, and then became this, you know, international political figure as a young girl. And I have some questions about her whole, you know, rise to power. But anyway, she did get shot in the face. Um, but uh, Khan never really condemned the Taliban for this. So that that definitely garnered him uh, some critics within the country and regionally as well. He, he didn't really officially condemn them. He's also called the Taliban, uh, you know, he's referred to them as our brothers. So he, you know, Taliban Khan, you, you get the idea. I don't think that's really all that bad a thing, though. Um, I think this is this could be a positive because the the fight the Taliban is not going to go away. Um, we can look right now in Afghanistan, uh, where I mean the Taliban are as strong as they've been in uh, you know years, if not a decade. Um, you know they they the as particularly in places like northern Afghanistan, cities are falling daily to the Taliban. Um, now, that's, now, that's not to say that they're necessarily under the control of the Taliban, but, you know, uh, they'll, they'll take over a city, they cut off the power, they, you know, kill a lot of uh, police or soldiers and stuff, they move on to another one. And it's not just, an, it's all over Afghanistan. This is happening in northern Afghanistan, it's happening in western Afghanistan, uh, it, it's happening all over the place. So the Taliban are, are not going away, and I think that needs to be accepted by a broader segment of the world basically so Imran Khan's uh, you know perceived pro-Taliban stance might be a good thing in insofar as fighting could stop and I'll, I'll point out as well that um, there there seems to there's more of a push coming from the US right now diplomatically to reach out to the Taliban now you know this is this is being again this is like so strange the way uh the, the this is being perceived in the US but you know it's being perceived that uh Trump is the again the kingmaker um by his supporters that he is this you know amazing diplomat who's going to stop wars you know he's an anti-interventionist uh, of course so he um he's going to stop uh fighting in Afghanistan basically if you get beyond these headlines um, what's really happening is Trump is pissy that uh, more progress isn't being made in Afghanistan to end the conflict. 
Um, and again, he has signed orders to, you know, supposedly reluctantly, uh, but to, to keep troops there. Uh, I mean, the fighting is not stopping. We're still, there's still, uh, drones. There, we're still bombing targets. You know, the air, the U.S. Air Force is quite active in Afghanistan. We still have a huge amount of soldiers and we're still occupying the country. But Trump is getting fed up with this or, you know, things aren't moving fast enough. So as a result, this has pushed American diplomats to uh, look for a more diplomatic end to the conflict in Afghanistan. So, and this is this is fairly new. I think this was just reported in the last day or so that uh, the U.S. is actually now uh, informally speaking with the Taliban. Um, so they've actually met, um, you know, officials of the U.S. government have met with officials of the Taliban in Doha, in Qatar. Uh, there, there's talk that they might meet in, um, I think, in the United Arab Emirates as well. Uh, you know, there, there, there is something, you know, and listen, I think that's as horrible as the Taliban is. I'm not saying they're like a great organization that we should all go out and join. I think a political uh, settlement is the only way to actually uh, stop. Maybe you're not going to stop all the violence, but you're going to stop the war, essentially, I think. You're going to stop the widespread uh, killing. You're going to stop, you know, you you can slowly get people to uh, turn in their arms, you know. And, um, you know, I think this is a... Listen, you know, we... we, we, um, we uh, uh, tried um, to do this before. You know, I mean, we have reached out to them, so it's not it's not unprecedented talking to the Taliban. And you know, when a moderate uh, leader was uh, elected, you know, to be the, the supreme leader of the Taliban, um, and this is uh, uh, Mullah Mansour, uh, the U.S. Uh, assassinated him. Okay, and that really didn't turn out so great. Um, you know, it was more violence. Uh, you know, more destruction uh, and basically more hardline members of the Taliban emerge. So there is a moderate wing of the Taliban. So Imran Khan might actually, that I think in that sense, he is good or, or he can do some good if he can get everyone to the negotiating table, um, you know, and, and uh, come up with some kind of a political solution to this. Now, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be nice. Uh, and it might actually mean that, you know, members of, of the Taliban are elected to office. Um, but again, you know, we've all sorts of war criminals elected to, to higher office all around the world, including here in the U.S. So, you know, that's, that's, that's nothing new. So that is a, another interesting uh, aspect of this. And, and, and a big takeaway. I think that we could actually see something happening in the next couple of years uh, vis-a-vis the Taliban. And, and, and certainly Pakistan would be a wonderful uh, you know, uh, uh, kingmaker in, in that sense. The other major takeaway, and I realize I'm, I'm running out of time and I want to get this in, is China. Now, how will relations with China play out? Pakistan and China have this, you know, uh, I think they, they call it like the all-weather friends. You know, they they are allies no matter what. Their militaries are extremely close, and China has been, you know, doing a ton of business in Pakistan. But it'll be interesting to see how that plays out with Imran Khan in power. Now, Khan has reached out uh, to China in his uh, victory speech. China was the first country uh, mentioned during the foreign policy section saying something like, um, you know, we're going to ask China how they brought, you know, millions of people out of poverty or something like that. But prominent members within the PTI, including his soon-to-be uh, finance minister, um, Assad Umar, have criticized China and the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And CPEC is part of China's grand a strategy to create this, uh, you know, one belt, one road initiative, this huge, you know, trade route and, and all this stuff. And Beijing has long been uh, suspicious of, of Khan and the PTI. Uh, the P- I mentioned before this, like, protest thing. The PTI, it, they staged a five-month sit-in in the government district uh, in Islamabad in 2014. And... Uh, Basically, this caused Xi Jinping to postpone a scheduled visit for a year because they couldn't get in. The PTI is also called uh, CPEC 
uh, it's a modern day East India company. Uh, the PTI has also attacked uh, CPEC and its connections to uh, Sh- uh, Shabazz Sharif. Um, while he was in charge of Punjab province, uh, you know, they alleged that Sharif was taking bribes or was giving contracts to CPEC to, to build roads and infrastructure projects. And, um, you know, and this is all kind of very verboten within the Pakistani elite, especially the military, to, to criticize China so openly. So that will also be really interesting to see how this plays out. Now, now, uh, China uh, sent an envoy to congratulate um, Imran Khan, uh, you know, and the, their embassy uh, wrote up a very nice statement. But I think, you know, China's kind of playing it casual um, <laughs> with all of this, and I think seeing how it's going to play out. But again, this will be really interesting given the fact that the U.S. and Pakistan have awful relations, or, the, you know, relations between the two countries are, are pretty low at the moment. Um, and I don't think Pakistan is really on Donald Trump's radar beyond, you know, uh, complaining that they're terrorists and stuff like that. You know, and, and he's criticized Pakistan. He's saying, like, you know, oh, uh, you know, we give them all this money and all they, they export is terrorism and stuff like that. But I don't think Pakistan is really big on Donald Trump's agenda. I would be surprised if he knows who Imran Khan is or that Imran Khan was even elected uh, prime minister. We haven't heard anything from Donald Trump about this, not even a tweet. Um, so with U.S. relations so strained, Pakistan has certainly been more open to embracing China, uh, more so than it ever has. Uh, so, it, But it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, especially given Donald Trump's dislike of China. Uh, maybe he will try to play the Pakistanis uh, against the Chinese. And very briefly, um, there are, you know, if you read a lot of Indian um, press uh, and uh, and also uh, Pakistani press, you know, there's this weird um, rumor or, or belief circulating that, you know, Imran Khan and Modi, the uh, prime minister of India, are not in cahoots, but that they're, you know, they're, they're maybe too friendly or uh, that, that they, you know, there was a, a rumor circulating that, that Modi was going to be invited to the inauguration. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and again, it, relationships between India and Pakistan have, are abysmal. I mean, they're, they're usually not very good, but they're extremely abysmal lately. So again, it, that will also be interesting to see how that plays out. How will Imran Khan uh, deal with, the, uh, with China? How will Imran Khan deal with India? And how will Imran Khan deal with Donald Trump? That, I think, is, is the – those are the interesting takeaways, is seeing how this new guy is going to interact with all of these moving parts, uh, especially given uh, – and, and, of course, Afghanistan. Um, you know, Ghani has is, is, uh, reached out to Khan, um, and, uh, and, and certainly, you know, both Afghanistan and Pakistan are, are making these overtures saying, oh, this is the – Start of a whole brand new relation and relationship, and and this is the start of something new, and we can make all this progress, and we're going to help Afghanistan, and blah blah, you know, the same crap that both sides have been saying for decades uh, while their people are suffering. But you know, again, given Ghani's, I mean, he he's almost completely powerless. It'll be interesting to see how Imran Khan uh, fits into. Uh, that that piece of the puzzle as well. So a lot of interesting stuff. I, I I hope I I hope I haven't bored you. I know that's a lot of uh, info on, on Pakistan, and and I encourage everyone to uh, check out the show notes uh, for this episode. Um, you know, don't get too confused with all of the different uh, you know acronyms for the political parties. There's a lot of them that uh, you know sound similar there's a lot of obscure political parties there's a lot of names and stuff might be a little overwhelming but if you can if you can kind of parse through that um, there's a lot going on here that I think is really interesting and how it's going to play out in the next couple of months and years is going to be very interesting and if you get past that kind of stuff I think look at the bigger picture um, how, what is Imran Khan actually going to do for Pakistan? Is he going to make Pakistan great again? 
Uh, how is Imran Khan going to interact with uh, organizations like the Taliban and also, uh, you know, Al Qaeda and uh, the Pakistani Taliban and you know, there's a whole slew of those groups and of course China. Well, uh, stay tuned, everybody. Uh, in the second hour, we're going to be talking with Kevin Gasola, so I will be right back. American Freedom Radio. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our stringent quality controls and absolute zero GMOs plus testing for heavy metals makes us unique in the storable foods market. Our line of fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Take out the amount you need and reseal the package for use within the next six months. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's www.simplycleanfoods.net today. This is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high fructose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. I don't like words that hide the truth. I don't like words that conceal reality. I don't like euphemisms. And American English is loaded with euphemisms. Because Americans have a lot of trouble dealing with reality. Americans have trouble facing the truth. So they invent the kind of a soft language to protect themselves from it. I'll give you an example of that. When I was a little kid, if I got sick, they wanted me to go to the hospital and see the doctor. Now they want me to go to a health maintenance organization. Smug, greedy, well-fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore. They neutralize people. The government doesn't lie. It engages in disinformation. Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? They never mention that part of it to us, do they? Never mention that part of it. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio in service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. 
click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Prepare your mind to experience American Freedom Radio. Walkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are joining us right now here in the second hour, we should be speaking momentarily with a good friend of the show, Kevin Gastola of Shadowproof.com. And uh, Kevin is, uh, uh, we're going to be speaking with Kevin about the uh, James Wolf uh, leaking investigation and also uh, Ali Watkins, who's a journalist who is connected to this. And uh, hopefully Kevin will be uh, on the line soon. Looks like he's just, he might just be running a little bit late. Uh, but uh, once we, we get Kevin, we will uh, bring him in immediately. Um, so, uh, Kevin, if you're listening, we're, we'd love to have you on the show now. Uh, but uh, any, oh, and I think uh, Kevin might uh, just be here, so uh, we'll we'll try to bring him in momentarily. But uh, once again, I just wanted to uh, plug the recent uh, Porkins uh, Porkins Policy Radio Bonus Podcast, uh, which you can find by going to patreoncom slash Redman, and you can become a subscriber for as little as a, a dollar a month. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. That was uh, my own fault. Um, so we'll, we'll get uh, Kevin on the line right now. Uh, but, uh, obviously, Danny is really the expert with uh, connecting calls and not me. Uh, Kevin Gasol, are you there? Hey. Hey, okay, there we go. Um, so my apologies for that. Uh, I'm obviously not as gifted uh, with uh, Skype as other people are. Uh, but, uh, Kevin, we are uh, going to be uh, t- talking today with you about something that we talked about, I think, the, the last time you were on the show. Uh, we mentioned, uh, you mentioned in passing, James Wolf, um, who we, we sort of, I guess, put James Wolf in the same category as a reality winner in terms of people that the Trump administration is going after. Um, so, why don't we, uh, for, well, first, I guess I, I totally forgot. Of course, you can find all of Kevin's work by going to shadowproof.com, but I think all the listeners know that. Uh, but Kevin, why don't you explain, uh, uh briefly, what uh, is the, uh, case that the government is alleging against James Wolf? You know, what is he accused of doing? Um, and, uh, and some of the specifics of that. And then we'll get to Allie Watkins and where she, uh, falls into this. But I guess, Kevin, first and foremost, who is James Wolf and what is he accused of doing? 
Right. So James Wolf uh, was a Senate Intelligence Committee aide, and the job that he had was to be a custodian of the classified information that basically comes in and out of the committee to uh, take care of it. And uh, this, there's a lot of hearings that happen before the Senate Intelligence Committee, particularly behind closed doors. And in recent months, actually for the last two years, we've had these meetings that involve alleged Russian election interference, uh, mm-hmm. talking about hacking and, and, and stuff like that. And you've had people who are connected to the President Donald Trump campaign uh, that have been uh, subpoenaed or, or or not necessarily subpoenaed or called before the committee to testify. And he would have known that those people were going to testify. He has prior knowledge of this and they have to secure this information so that they can protect it from leaks. Uh, so, you know, his job was to protect this information. Uh, and so then what happened is um, he um, allegedly uh, released or tipped off a reporter. This is what the government accuses. I'm not necessarily saying whether I agree or believe this to have happened. I'm saying that uh, the indictment against him involves allegedly lying to FBI agents about his contacts with at least four journalists. Mm. And particularly, they claim that he confirmed to reporters that Carter Page the former Trump campaign advisor, was testifying before the committee. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, any anyone who tunes into CNN on any given day or MSNBC on any given day, there's a, there's a hunger for constant morsels about this investigation into yeah. the Trump campaign. And so, uh, obviously, you know, someone who had this kind of access probably would have come into contact with reporters who were trying to work them as a potential source and whether or not he in fact did provide information he's going to interact with reporters um, his job you know naturally within the the US Senate would bring him into contact with media and in fact the bigger story here which I know we'll get into in more depth and detail is that the person, who is alleged to have um, obtained some of this information is a New York Times reporter, uh, Ali Watkins. Mm. And uh, they were, according to the agents, having a relationship. And she doesn't deny it that this, in fact, was happening. But uh, these the uh, FBI agents became aware during the investigation of these leaks that these two individuals had had a relationship that stretched on for at least more than a year or so and so that's another aspect of this case which we can get into in the more detail but basically wolf is is not charged with violating the espionage act like right. these other cases that we have discussed uh it's it's not like reality winner uh, or it's not like Terry Albury who is this uh FBI agent um, who was working in a, an airport up in Minneapolis and was a liaison kind of figure and was charged with a leak. This is called this is a, but it could be called an, a, a, a leak related offense or it's it, it, it still falls into the same framework of yeah. crackdowns on leaks uh, because instead of charging this person with a leak, they're charging this person with lying about a leak. <laughs> and alleging that he hid that leaking from FBI agents and was not forthright when he was interrogated. Uh, because naturally, there's been so much in the media about the Trump investigation itself that people within the FBI have been calling individuals into offices and interrogating them and trying to figure out what kind of sources they have. And so James Wolf became a target, and this is... Um, you know, now what he faces is um, at least uh, potentially several years in prison if convicted of this offense. And also, we should we should point out that uh, Wolf has held this position, a chief of security for the Senate Intelligence Committee, for like thirty years. Um, so he's he's well known. He's been doing this for a while, and I can only assume that he's been leaking. You know, for probably thirty years. Um, and 
very quickly, Kevin, I mean, is is there is it illegal? What you know, if he did leak information to journalists about Carter Page, I mean, is that illegal? Uh, I mean, again, because it seems like the, the, my issue with a lot of this, like the I don't know, uh, the war on leakers and stuff, is that uh, Washington is just full of this. I mean, this is how this is the only way that a lot of reporters actually get any information. You know, they're not really uh, digging into stuff. I mean, you know, like you, for instance, Kevin, you travel around the country, you talk to people, um, you know, you, you interview uh, different individuals, you've, you've, you know, you've gone to prison to, to conduct interviews, you know, but a lot of, for a lot of these, like, national security reporters in Washington, they're basically relying on the James Wolfs out there to give them information. So is it, a, is it against the law uh, for him to have uh, told journalists about this? Because my understanding is that it, it's not even that offense that they're upset about. It's the fact that he lied about it. So is, is it illegal to uh, leak information like that? I'd say that, first, it is really important to emphasize that he's a career uh, employee of, of the Senate Intelligence Committee, that he was the director of security for 30 years. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Uh, and also, uh, on top of that, uh, he was an intelligence analyst in the U.S. Army from 1983 to 1987. Mm. Um, and so this is someone who would take his job seriously, and I don't think he's going to just leak information to journalists without uh, being careful um, and or having uh, good reasons. Or uh, I, I just... I don't think that he's going to be somebody that keeps a lot of sources because if you do, you're going to be found out. I mean, my guess is that someone doesn't get to be a security officer for <laughs> a committee for 30 years if they're leaking unless they develop a system for doing that that is right. undetectable. Um, and so I don't know. I can't personally sit here on the show today and say that he didn't have uh, an array of sources uh, with people that he was speaking to. But I know that the the natural way in which people work and function in D.C. is that there is a culture where journalists are mingling with people like James Wolfe all the time. I mean, the reason why Ali Watkins uh, gets to date and have a relationship with someone like James Wolfe is because there is that sort of culture within Washington, D.C. And so uh, as far as whether he committed a crime... Uh, this is actually going to sound very similar to the conversation we've had about reality winners. So you sign a, a non-disclosure agreement. I'm sure mm -hmm. you signed multiple non-disclosure agreements. You have policies. You know how you're supposed to protect the classified information. He himself is aware of all of the policies for protecting that classified information because he's a security officer who's taking steps to protect the information. And so that could have opened him up to a prosecution under the Espionage Act if he's the one leaking, if the government wanted to prove that he was leaking. Uh, for whatever reason, the Justice Department decided that they would like to or have a better shot of getting him for lying to FBI agents. Um, and that's simply because if you look at the interrogation with the FBI, he is... He, it, it's similar to what happened with Reality Winner in the sense that FBI agents raise information with him and then he backtracks and admits that he's had um, interactions and contact with reporters. And so then the FBI takes that to be a lie that you are hiding your interactions with the press from mm -hmm. the FBI in this interrogation. So it's it doesn't necessarily mean that they were able to pinpoint the leak Maybe they're not able to actually figure out what exactly he disclosed, but they're pretty certain that he's hiding from the authorities the fact that he has leaked information to the public. And so then they just charge him with lying to FBI because you have, again, it becomes pretty basic. It's very similar to what they could have done to Reality Winner, and people who listen to your show know because we've talked about it a lot. On, on this program about reality's case that she was interrogated in her house and she wasn't being honest about what she had done with the mm -hmm. NSA report that she took out of um, the facility where she was working in Georgia 
and eventually, and as the office, as the agents are talking to her, they're leaning on her. They're saying, you know, you would not want to lie to an FBI agent. And so then eventually they do get that confession from her where she admits she took the document out of the facility. And it's similar here in this case, because that's what the FBI is doing is they, uh, this is why a lot of people say never talk to the FBI, never ever talk to the FBI. Uh, alone, get a lawyer, um, mm-hmm. refuse refuse to talk to a, the FBI. Anytime you talk to an FBI agent, they are going to be trying to incriminate you. And mm-hmm. they're asking very basic questions of James Wolf about what he's done, and, and they don't let on what they know about him, and then eventually they catch him in a moment where he has to backtrack and say that, yes, you're right, I was having interactions with reporters and so then that's where you get the basis for the indictment to uh, charge him with committing a crime Mm. and i'll I'll just uh echo uh, kevin's suggestion there to not talk to the fbi uh as well because the fbi won't record conversations so it, you know, there, there's no, there's no like, like the official record of a of an of an interview that an FBI agent conducts with somebody is like written by that FBI agent later, and it's not like a word for word transcript. So they can say whatever they want. Um, I forget what the the name of the form is, but that's another reason because they can just make shit up if they want to. They they don't, well, you know, it, it's they're not sitting there. It's not like if you're in a if you're in police lockup here. You know, they're, they're recording what you're saying, but an FBI agent has, is under no obligation to do that. That's true. Uh, I, I will just add, though, that they have a, they had a recording of the interaction mm. with Reality Winner, and, and, and I heard it in court, and they, they could play it back. Uh, so then the thing becomes, which is the actual concern about any time uh, the similar people will recognize to the concerns about police having body cameras is that you could turn off the device and turn it back on whenever you want. So the yeah, FBI, <laughs> so the FBI has the uh, audio equipment that they're taking in, and uh, you know they're they've got it set up and they're taking a recording, and then when they are done doing what they want, they can turn it off. But you know what happens in that time that isn't being recorded can be as important as what was recorded. Right, absolutely. Um, uh, and again, you know, never speak to any law enforcement without a lawyer. <laughs> you know, that, that should just go without saying. Um, but uh, uh, let's let's uh, break down the the other side of this story because it it, it has taken on uh, a very salacious tone, uh, and it it's, it uh, you know it, it I'm sure you saw these articles, Kevin, like d- describing it as like House of Cards. You know, uh, become real or something like that. Um, and that is the, the insertion of Allie Watkins into this story. So if you look at the indictment, uh, against James Wolfe, there are a number of journalists, you know, journalist one, journalist two, three, four, that are described. We don't know who the other, uh, three journalists are, but we know that journalist two in the indictment is Allie Watkins. And we also know that Allie Watkins had her phone records, like emails, uh, texts, even encrypted messaging uh, that she was using, uh, that have all been confiscated, uh, I assume by the FBI, as part of this investigation. And no, no other journalists uh, that are named in the indictment have had their records seized. And we also know that Allie Watkins was having a three-year relationship with James Wolf, she has claimed that that relationship ended, uh, I guess, before she went to work for the New York Times, which is where she was uh, when the story broke. Uh, but you know, and she claims that uh, she never used James Wolf as a source. And there are sort of varying uh, uh, stories from uh, you know different outlets that she worked at. Some of some of which knew that she was dating James Wolf. Some of which who knew that she was dating somebody in the intelligence community, but didn't know it was Wolf specifically. Um, can you parse that out for us a little bit, Kevin? Uh, and you know, like, because this this layer of the story is 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 particularly fascinating, if a bit kind of like gossipy. Um, 
then also Allie Watkins was like part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize. So she's she's and she's had this very meteoric rise within journalism, and now that kind of all seems to be in jeopardy because of this. So who is Allie Watkins and how does she fit into James Wolfe? Yeah. So if I could, let's start with the before we get into the salacious, I'll sort of keep <laughs> your listeners on edge here and talk about uh just just again sticking with government corruption before yeah. we get into uh some of the personal aspects of this story that you know are going to be fun to to talk about here we're going to sound slightly gossipy for a little while yeah but that's and okay it'll be, and it'll be fun but uh but the serious thing the very critical press freedom issue here is that mm. the records were seized and uh she was notified that uh they were seized uh but the new york times didn't know and part of that had to do with the fact that the notice was being given to uh like like somehow she and her attorney found out but the people running the newspaper never found out and so then the new york times couldn't take the steps they needed to in order to fight back and make it public in the press uh so that's a that's an odd wrinkle to this um but additionally so the the records were seized and i i found this to be um okay so you know again for example you have reporters committee for freedom of the press saying things like seizing a journalist record sends a terrible message to the public and should never be considered except as a last resort in a truly essential investigation so again like these groups were getting worked up up understandably and pointing out how this is a a terrible thing i don't know if you're Listeners will remember, but let's go back to 2013 because we've had a situ- we, we've we've had a, a, a moment in recent history where the phone records of a media company were seized, and I did a bit of a comparison in my initial coverage because I remembered this, and that the Associated Press had uh, the records of 20 separate telephone lines seized mm. in April and May of 2012 uh, when Obama was president. Um, and the CEO, I'll just, I'll refresh your listeners' memory. The CEO said these records potentially reveal communications with confidential sources across all of the news gathering activities undertaken by the AP during a two month period, provide a roadmap to AP's news gathering operations, and disclose information about AP's activities and operations that the government has no conceivable right to know. And so that was a big deal. They were looking into a leak. It uh, involved the uh, plot, this, this, this undercover uh, intelligence operation that had been going on in Yemen around uh, – it actually was um, – had a nice uh, little aspect to it where apparently they had been developing a device that was an explosive – a uh, garment uh, that that somebody right. could wear, like underwear, and yeah, exactly. um, and the FBI or uh, I think it was the FBI was working um, with uh, a, a source or informant with with the development of this device, and I think they were looking to sabotage it or or or, or yeah. something like that, and so it was published in the press before the operation was completed that this was ongoing, and so as a definite risk to what the FBI was trying to accomplish. And so they decided to sweep up the records without targeting any specific journalists. They swept up the communications of all these journalists that are involved in these daily uh, conversations with sources, potential sources that, you know, they might be talking about anything that, like, is related to corruption within the FBI. I mean, if you had heard chatter, you could have passed it on to your boss and said, I just caught wind that the AP is working on this new story about something the FBI is doing that we don't want the public to know. And so that refreshes your memory. And in comparison, 2013 compared to this, is it, it just doesn't even compare. This is actually more targeted. I, I, I did... I'm not giving anybody credit, but I just think in terms of understanding what's going on here, we're talking about four specific journalists or three specific journalists that are being uh, targeted here with their communications being intercepted um, and, and their records seized or, or uh, I guess their communications aren't being intercepted. The records of their communications are being seized 
and uh, that is uh, something that was was done in a, in a in a in a better way. It wasn't as broad as the Obama administration. Uh, and it, and to, to my knowledge, so far we haven't heard the language that was used uh, by the Obama administration. You also might remember in 2013 that they referred to Fox News reporter James Rosen as an aider, a better, and co-conspirator in a leak. Mm-hmm. So they sort of treated him as like an enemy when they were investigating um, him because he had obtained a leak from uh, a State Department employee, Stephen Kim. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... Uh, that didn't happen in this case. So far, we have not found evidence that Ali Watkins or any of these other reporters were treated as if they were like helping James Wolfe to break some law or or, or, or violate uh, ethics as far as someone who's a classified information officer or in charge of security for the intelligence committee. Okay, now uh, we can get it. Unless you have anything to add, we can get it. Well, I was just going to throw out. I mean, yeah, it, it's not. They're not alleging that Allie Watkins disclosed classified information. You know, it, it's not. And I, I mean, I, I don't. I doubt um, that she never used him as a source. And there are certainly like text messages and stuff that have become public now that suggest that you know she did use him at times. But it's not as if um, there's some bombshell that she, you know, it's not like she's reporting on, uh, you know, some Russian sleeper cell, you know, in in the you know in the administration or something like that. There's nothing, as far as we know, there's nothing in her own reporting to suggest that she got classified information from James Wolf. Um, so, you know, just to make that clear, and also that it, it's just, just, I'll just say it again. I mean, it, um, the, the New York Times reported that, I mean, they seized years worth of her, uh, phone and email records. And, um, you know, I, I've seen it reported too that they, uh, you know, cracked her encrypted messages as well. I don't know what she was using. She was using Signal or, or another encryption, uh, messaging app, but supposedly they, they even cracked those. Um, and I know that that was a thing too that, you know, James Wolf was supposedly using these encrypted apps and that was part of why the FBI was going after him as well. So, um, j- just throw that out there. But now, I've, yeah, Kevin. So, so I've seen people uh, highlighting this issue with Signal and, uh, just for people who want to protect themselves from the government to the most, to the largest extent possible, you have to send disappearing messages on Signal or else. Yeah. They're still there um, inside of the app for people to to get. Um, that doesn't mean that like leaving them there isn't still better than using some other means, but definitely having that setting uh, goes an extra way to protect yourself. So I, I saw some people uh, speculating that maybe one of the things was that like they're not actually using the app to the fullest uh, possible way that you could so that you could protect your communications because then all of these messages would still be there for the FBI to collect mm. um, and, and go over. Uh, but maybe there's also another way. I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, Edward Snowden will come out at, at two or three weeks from now and, and, and let us all know that they can crack signal. I mean, I'm sure that there's some way that they're working oh, yeah. to break into it. Um which is again, I guess, another reason why you would want to be uh, working. You want to be using the the disappearing ability if, if in fact, you were trying to have a conversation that was sensitive, um, and particularly in in, in journalism. Mm. So, uh, let's see. Um, oh, and what you're saying about this going back, I, I think that's important too. Is is it did go back to even taking messages that were from her university email address when she was a student and was working at a a university newspaper. Um, And that would have actually, that would have absolutely nothing to do with anything that is happening now, but just Mm. this idea that like maybe possibly uh, she had some kind of relation with some of these people. And, And also I think it becomes a way to find out if any other people had leaked to her before because she has this profile. So, I mean, we can just, before we get into the salacious stuff and start to make her, um, seem like some kind of, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, 
vixen or whatever you yes. think we're <laughs> yeah, going yeah. to do. Let's just be clear here. She's she's worked very well, and she was uh, the the winner or nominated for awards related to her reporting on the way in which the CIA was spying on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I mean, they broke into files while the committee was trying to put together the torture report. And there was a huge scandal. Uh, it wasn't as big as it should have been. John Brennan, the CIA chief, should have had to resign over it. He managed to keep his job. But they were fighting to undermine the investigation. They were collecting intelligence on the Senate about this investigation, this study into the torture program before it was completed and trying to manage it uh, because they wanted to be able to push back against it and challenge some of its core assertions. Now, I think because of how well it was done by the Senate, it became very difficult for them to uh, diminish its importance, but you know, you you still have the fact that they were in the uh, systems and should not have been. And that was something that uh, Ali, uh, she sat um, outside of uh, these doors, um, waited for people to come in and out of these hearings. She was um, doing good reporting and forming uh, base, a base of sources, people that she could get this information about so she could reveal to people what was going on as the CIA was um, trying to protect itself from accountability. And so she's a really good reporter, and um, she's done amazing work. I've uh, There's a report that she worked on. She's, re- she's worked on stuff, I believe, related to um, the Insider Threat Program, which we've talked about on this show. Mm-hmm. And so um, I've used some of her reporting on that to really supplement... Uh, my coverage of whistleblowers, the war on whistleblowers. So she did really good work. And so now, you know, the thing that basically has happened in the last uh, weeks here is that she's been reassigned. The New York Times reassigned her. Um, she's doing work now to a new beat. But she's no longer working in the Washington Bureau, and which means that she's not working on the stuff that She's been able to do a really good job of uh, collecting uh, uh, stories and exposing what uh, federal law enforcement is doing. It's been very important to Mm -hmm. her, um, and it's been important to us. I think we've learned a lot. I don't think we're better off that Ali Watkins, um, and she's 26 years old, I don't think we're better off that she's not working on this. I mean, she's young. She's got a lot of energy. She can work on this stuff very aggressively because she's still early in her career and now she's assigned to another beat uh, because they've had, because of how the New York Times has decided to handle this. Uh, And then you've had all this stuff come out and so the New York Times published this huge thing that actually got a lot of attention and there was a lot of division and maybe you and I are going to get into a debate about and I don't know where you come down, but there's a whole thing where the headline said, how an affair between a reporter and a security Mm. aide has rattled Washington media. And basically, you know, there's, there, there are reporters, including, uh, Scott Shane, who's a very big national security reporter. They dug into what had happened and a lot of people accused the newspaper of publicly shaming their own reporter through this, uh, piece of journalism. It sort of like exposes all the stuff that, that she was doing and is kind of embarrassing to her in some ways. And like you say, it it may prevent her from getting jobs further on down the road. So is that really what you'd like to get from your newspaper, which could, which you'd hope would have your back and would support you in this situation? Um, Instead, I don't know why they needed to do this, but, and I don't know why it's not like the Washington Post or some other newspaper that could probably do this, but they're basically revealing warts and all everything that could have gone on that was wrong. And well, did we do something wrong? They're they're telling everybody uh, what happened. And there's things like uh, this bracelet. Yeah, um, yeah, and. Uh, um, I mean, I could just read this for you. There's a pearl bracelet 
They op- so they open the whole story with this purple pearl this pearl bracelet on Valentine's re- Day, right? That she received in May 2014. She's a senior in college, um, and uh, she was uh, then she was 22 years old. She was working as an intern for McClatchy Newspapers, and James Wolfe is um, in his 50s, and he he's a helpful source, and uh, he gives her a Valentine's Day card. And the bracelet suggests uh, that, you know, he's not happy with just having a professional relationship. He would like to do more than that. Um, and then eventually that is what leads to a three-year affair that they have. Um, because I think it was broken off in 2017. Um, and it was broken off. The their, their relationship ended not long before. He ends up leaving his position at the Intelligence Committee um, and, and again, coinciding with the fact that the FBI is now investigating him. Mm-hmm. No, the 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 bracelet thing is weird. The, I actually found the whole article uh, kind of bizarre. Um, it's inter- You know, we'll link up to it. Um, and there is there is one really fascinating tidbit in that this Times article. But I, I was I actually kind of found it a little offensive. They never once. Uh, as far as I remember, like actually uh, talk about the James Wolf case. You know, there's not even a, a hyperlink to um, you know what what James Wolf is being accused of. There's like nothing about that. Instead, it's like this very long article, uh, essentially talking about Ali Watkins' sex life without you know without literally getting into it. You know. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know. I, I it almost felt like the Times were were just doing it out of spite or something, or you know, like to to protect themselves and kind of like throwing her under the bus, and you know, making her look like some sort of trashy reporter that was. I mean, the the insinuation throughout the article is that she was, uh, you know, trading sex for information, basically. Yeah. Um, and and that's a big deal. Um, and, and I think that uh, you know, there's a woman, uh, Margaret Sullivan, who I've followed. Uh, I actually intersected with her, uh, not in person, but through the work I was doing covering Chelsea Manning. Um, she was the public editor for the New York Times for the longest uh, for for a period and and she harped on them to do more coverage of the Manning case and was using my reporting to show that it was important to send people from the New York Times to cover Chelsea Manning's court martial and so she wrote a really good column at the Washington Post where she covers media now and was digging into this whole thing of like how you know, she really doesn't want to come down on on Ali because you know, she's a young woman. She's doing very, very good work. But at the same time, if, if in fact it is the case that she's selling herself in order to get sources and get information from those sources, then she feels like that's a setback for women who are trying to advance in media. And so I, I it's hard for me to come down in, in any place on that issue just because I think this is one time where I think I'll just invoke my gender and be like, I don't I don't really know that I can very fairly uh, say anything about that because it's not something I'd ever have to deal with. All I can do mm. is listen to what people would tell me about it um, and and I think maybe it's unfair to presume that she's just sleeping with people because she wants to get information. I mean, perhaps she really did like this individual. I mean, she's capable of getting sources and she seemed to do a well enough job. And, and there's no evidence that she's sleeping with every single person that she, no. um, and, and so maybe this just happened to be a thing that is highly unusual, particularly because they're separated by 30 years in age. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know that's really odd, but I mean, I also know that there are relationships out there like that. And Donald Trump and his, why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so I mean, I try not to dig into that too much, but I think what is in, unmistakable is uh, there's this Fast Company article that I have in front of me. And I just wanted to raise this. Um, I, I don't know all the details, so I'll keep it very basic. And, and if you wanted to add anything, you could. But 
might remember that Glenn Thrush was a reporter for the New York Times, and he ended up <laughs> losing his job, um, or he was reassigned, um, because he was accused of sexual um, harassment. And, and uh, uh, so what happened to him? I mean, the, this piece makes a point about how the Times handled Thrush's case differently than Watkins. And you might find this interesting that the Times had a media report reporter do some updates on Thrush, but they didn't dig into his case. They didn't do a full dive into Thrush's past history and his interactions with people. They didn't put reporters on a story and say, you know, go hunt down and figure out what has been happening underneath our noses and we just weren't paying any attention. Um, and so basically Watkins you know, she has all this dirty laundry aired about her, but Thrush didn't even have to go through that. And I think what people were saying about him was far more serious than the allegations about, you know, consensually sleeping with somebody who was the Senate Intelligence Committee aide. I mean, that's not a crime. That's no. just like, that's just like maybe unethical, slightly unprofessional behavior if you're working for the New York Times, that like maybe you ought to be smarter and not do it, but um, I don't think that that's anything that, you know, it, it shouldn't get more attention than somebody who is legitimately accused of sexual harassment. Totally. Oh, yeah, and, they, and they, no, no, the, the Glenn Thrush thing is interesting because it just, I mean, he, I, he kind of just faded away, you know, um, uh, even though, I mean, he was accused of some really nasty stuff, um, whereas, you know, Allie Watkins is, uh, I mean, especially if you go to some of the uh, more disgusting sectors of the Internet. I mean, you know, she's a prostitute and all of these horrible insults are being hurled at her. And, yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, there's something illegal uh, about sleeping or having a relationship with James Wolfe. I mean, it may be, uh, you know, a little unethical. If you're a journalist, it may be a bad choice, but that's about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just, a, it's interesting, you know, the way that it is being framed. And, and I, I am sort of of two minds because it's like, on one level, it's like, um, I, I could really care less who this uh, woman sleeps with. On the other, you know, side of it, I do get the point that it's like, whether, you know, she meant to or not, I mean, she is, um, I, I think it, it inadvertently, casts a negative eye on on all journalists in general and particularly female journalists that now you know they're always going to have this not always but f for the moment they're going to have this sort of cloud over them like huh you know it makes you wonder um, about their relationships with various people um, which is not to say too that I mean a male journalist could be doing the exact same thing um, you know I, I, but I, I doubt we're going to hear a story about that um, so the other thing is that also, just to be clear, she's working for multiple organizations over this period of time that she's with Wolf. Um, right. She's she worked for Politico. She had a job at BuzzFeed. She was a Huffington Post journalist, and at all of those occasions, she was reporting on the Senate Intelligence Committee. And I and I don't think it's fair to say that everything she would be getting would come from James necessarily. I mean. She's doing a very basic thing that a lot of people don't do. They just don't have the patience to do it. But it's hard to argue with the fact that if you sat outside of the doors where a lot of this business was going on daily and you had the compulsion to stop people in the hall and ask them questions because you knew they were involved in this stuff, I mean, it stands to reason that you're going to get some people to talk to you and you're going to be able to find – you're going to overhear chatter – and that's just very good reporting. So what I'm trying to say is that it's it's impossible that, like, James Wolfe would know all of everything that she ever revealed or wrote hmm. about. Well, yeah, and, and again, we'll, let's be clear. I mean, they haven't alleged anything concrete at all. You know, they're not – they haven't accused Ali Watkins of – uh, you know, disclosing classified information in an article. They're not accusing James Wolfe of leaking national security. You know, all they're doing is um, 
uh, is uh, accusing James Wolf of lying to the FBI and for whatever reason seizing all of Allie Watkins uh, records and making it publicly known that she because again too there's other journalists named in that indictment we don't know who they are are they you know was James Wolf sleeping with them um, you know, was uh, was his relationship with any of those other journalists? So it it, it is fascinating that they are are uh, going after her, and I think it is in part because it is salacious, um, and it, it it is sort of a great distraction. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the story is becoming you know these this reporter who's acting inappropriately with a source who's you know. I don't know what twenty, thirty years older than her, and they're having sex, and maybe he would, you know. I mean, again, it also it just it conjures up all these like ridiculous images, like that, you know, during their you know pillow talk, he was telling her about Russian spies, and you know when John Podesta had to you know go to a skiff in the Senate and te- you know give information and stuff like that. I mean, I you know I can't really imagine all of that as being true. Um, and there is the one interesting thing, and I wanted to get your take on this, Kevin, is um, this bizarre moment. Uh, I think the, the Times refers to it as a bizarre tale um, that happened in June of 2017. When uh, and this was when uh, Allie Watkins was uh, working for Politico, and she went to her uh, editors and talked about this strange encounter that she had the day before where she received an anonymous email, and this is from the Times article. She said she received an anonymous email from a man who claimed to work for the government and wanted to meet her. Over drinks at a Dewpoint Circle bar, the man quizzed Miss Watkins about her sources on a story about Russian espionage. He then stunned her by reciting the itinerary of her recent vacation to Spain, including stops at Heathrow Airport and the Canary Islands. Uh, he also knew with whom she had traveled, Mr. Wolf. And then, um, you know, he says that he's uh, he's been reassigned to Washington to look in, you know, to, to investigate leaks um, to the press and that he... You know, he wants her help in uh, identifying some government officials who might be leaking to the press. And then, according to her, he says, quote, it would turn your life upside down if this ended up in the Washington Post, that she was sleeping or had slept with, you know, had an affair with uh, James Wolf. Um, this guy then turns out to be, of all names, Jeffrey A. Rambo, a Customs and Border Protection agent stationed in California. And there's like no real explanation for what this guy was doing in uh, D.C. or why a Border Patrol agent would be investigating leaks on behalf of the government, I guess, or the White House. I don't know. Um, and the like Border and Customs, like they 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 basically like just gave this strange answer as to why he was even there. Um, and I think they said, oh, it's being handled internally or, or something. I can't remember exactly. I'll try to find it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, Kevin, what the fuck is going on with, with, with Rambo and uh, this encounter? So Rambo, uh, unfortunately, seems like he's become a scapegoat mm. because on July 12th, the New York Times covered the fact that he seems to have been accused of uh, misusing a government computer system uh, when he uh, went through these conve- confidential travel records of Ali Watkins and then used them to press her about sources. Um, and so um, at the time, he was at the National Targeting Center, which is in Sterling, Virginia. And that has all kinds of data on millions of Americans and foreigners. So it's all the stuff that Homeland Security is collecting on us and Customs and Border Patrol is collecting on us is there. And so the Inspector General is now examining... Um, how he acted, and it looks like, you know, this is where I'm going to take the liberty of gossiping a little bit. It just seems like he probably was told by some. I, I want to believe. I think that the story and like the way that government works and and the way, particularly how the Trump administra- administration has functioned. But you could even draw a through line all the way back to the Obama administration. Just have to believe that, like, maybe 
there was something going on in this office. Uh, okay, I guess on second thought, this is probably unique to Donald Trump. But I just had to believe that there was something going on within this office. And it led him to think that he had the permission to do his own investigation into what was going on here. Maybe there was ex- additional pressure to try to uh, find leakers, and he wanted to help and thought that he would be able to save the day and get some kind of reward or he would get a promotion or someone would pat him on the back because he was able to expose um, uh, and, and find who was releasing all this information about Donald Trump to the media. But uh, now it looks like uh, they're not going to be able to defend this guy and, and he probably will end up losing his his job or maybe uh, have to be reassigned and sent somewhere else in Homeland Security with without access to this sensitive data. So, yeah, it is, it's super creepy. I mean, he shows up and he just starts talking to you. And, and the way I had read the story is that he's, he met with Ali and, the, and Ali thought she was meeting with a source, uh, someone yeah. who was going to provide information for an article. And at some point, the, to, the, the, the exchange turns around and she realizes, no, you're trying to collect information about me when I'm the one who's here to get information from you. And so that was what really shifted the dynamic and made her concerned about what was going on. And of course, he's just point blank telling her that <laughs> he's trying to expose these leaks and that's what he's there to do. So, I mean, I don't know how long she sat there afterwards and I don't know what you would do in that situation. I mean, you have to probably complete the conversation somehow or right. I mean, it's a little bit frightening if you've got anyone that's either an FBI agent or a border patrol agent across from you. I think you just kind of like presume they have some kind of authority to hold you there and talk. Uh, but of course he was off the job and he wasn't on any official duty when he was having this conversation. So that's why the Homeland Security Inspector General is, you know, particularly interested in trying to figure out what happened here and get to the bottom of this because there shouldn't, as far as I know, there's no policy about blackmailing journalists <laughs> into exposing. No way, yeah. If, if that's where we've gone though, I mean, I've got, I've got a lot to hunt down here after we get done talking. I mean, I've got a lot to do for the rest of 2018 because it seems like the war on leaks has escalated considerably and, and, and now we've got basically like secret police forces going around trying to blackmail journalists. So that's, that's a serious thing. But I, I, from what we've read, it does seem like this is an, a, an abnormality and, and not necessarily typical. But we know just from talking about Donald Trump and following Jeff Sessions and the Justice Department that they have ramped up their language and the way they talk about leaks and, and how they are in a panic. And you've seen Donald Trump's all caps tweets where he <laughs> is against leaks. And you just know that that people who are employees of these federal agencies feel that and they know that uh, – I think some people probably feel like they could elect to take it upon themselves to try and police their own and do these kinds of things to protect the government. Well, yeah, and I think that that's, you know, I'm leaning towards that explanation. Of course, the conspiracy theorist in me, um, you know, can't help but wonder if there (laughs) isn't some, you know, secretive group uh, initiated by Trump or by one of his cronies um, you know, and, and using people like in border protection, if if they can get information on travel records and, and things like that, and press people. Um, you know, it's like both of those scenarios are terrifying. Like if there is a secret police going after leakers that's like organized, or if it, it's just like the the environment is such that uh, people are just taking it upon themselves to go around. Like that's even crazier in a way. Like this guy is like spending his own money and time traveling across the country to blackmail a journalist. Um, I mean, so, the other thing is, how did he know? You know what I mean? Like, what tipped him off to to look into her? That's a good question. Uh, um, so you know, so the stuff that was reported again. The 
we don't know exactly what they think Wolf leaked, but the coverage says he knew that Carter Page was testifying. Mm. So then this becomes, there are journalists who are getting this information about the Trump investigation. What we don't really know up to this point, so we know behavior-wise is the way that Donald Trump acts. He's very, very upset about all this attention to the Trump investigation. I mean, he's he's very upset about it. And so maybe oh. he would, there would be this pressure internally to, to do this kind of thing. We are at the break right now, um, so uh, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Kevin, but uh, you can, of course, go to shadowproof.com to check out all of Kevin's work, and we will have Kevin back on the show uh, very soon to discuss this case and much more. So thank you all so much for listening, and I'll be talking to you very soon. No rules, no rules, no taboo topics, no taboo topics, no fear of doom, no fear of doom. We are, we are American Freedom Radio, American Freedom Radio. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our stringent quality controls and absolute zero GMOs plus testing for heavy metals makes us unique in the storable foods market. Our line of fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Take out the amount you need and reseal the package for use within the next six months. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's www.simplycleanfoods.net today. This is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high food dose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. Assassination. You know what's interesting about assassination? Well, not only does it change those popularity polls in a big hurry, but it's also interesting to notice who it is we assassinate. Do you ever notice who it is? Stop to think of who it is we kill. It's always people who've told us to live together in harmony and try to love one another. Jesus, Gandhi, Lincoln, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John Lennon. They all said, try to live together peacefully. Bam! Right in the f- head. Apparently we're not ready for that. Yeah, that's difficult behavior for us. We're too busy thinking around, sitting around trying to think up ways to kill each other. Here's one we came up with. It's efficient, too. Genocide. You know? Killing large numbers of people simply because they don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they don't have the same kind of hats you do. You ever notice that anytime you see two groups of people who really hate each other, chances are good they're wearing different kind of hats. Keep an eye on that. It might be important. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? 
The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Prepare your mind to experience American Freedom Radio.